Welcome to Mastoid Obliteration using autogenous bone pate and fascia. We will detail a six-step process to allow successful mastoid obliteration in anticipation of second stage transcanal ossicular reconstruction. In the first portion of our presentation, we will show you how to prepare and position the patient. A posterior incision is made that's further posteriorly than the usual incision for mastoid surgery. Hair removal is performed in order to allow adequate exposure. Tape is used to prepare the site. And the posterior incision is injected with equal parts of 1.5% bupivacaine and 2% xylocaine with 1 to 100,000 epinephrine. It's the final result. You'll notice also that the facial nerve monitor is intact as over a third of these patients have had dehiscent facial nerves. This is the microscopic view with the malleus and the facial ridge being demonstrated. The anterior sulcus of the tympanic membrane is highlighted in black. The malleus and the remnant tympanic membrane are visible. And the mastoid bowl is around the corner which will be much more easy to see in a few moments. In most cases the malleus is not present, but if it is present, can be utilized for reconstruction. The external auditory canal is injected with 2% xylocaine with 1 to 20,000 epinephrine. This serves to reduce the pain and the need for anesthesia, as well as to provide some hemostasis. Here the previous incision is demonstrated with a 15 blade, and a secondary incision is made more posteriorly in order to allow exposure of the cortex and temporal parietal bone for harvest. As you'll see in a moment, a large amount of fascia is needed for this procedure and this larger and more superior incision allows harvesting of fascia in a much easier way. The periosteum is divided with cautery and the first step that's performed is harvest of the bone pate. Here an elevator is being used in order to expose the cortex of the mastoid. It's critical to remain outside of the bacteria and epithelium containing mastoid cavity. You see the pericranium and muscular attachments being divided posteriorly and anteriorly to the margin of the mastoid bowl. Again, every attempt is made not to penetrate the skin of the bowl itself. the two building blocks of reconstruction are then harvested. The first is fascia and in this example you can see where the previous surgeons harvested fascia at the inferior margin of the temporalis muscle. More superiorly and aided with a small retractor it's possible and necessary to harvest a very large piece of fascia as you'll see in a moment. The fascia is placed on a delrin block and any musculature attachment is removed. Here you see the size of the fascia which is much bigger than usual with a tympanoplasty. The fascia is allowed to dry and the bone pate collector with the rubber seal, the mesh screen, and the cap is assembled. During the drilling, it is absolutely critical that a half gram of chloromycetin be added to the irrigation itself. Here you see a six millimeter burr harvesting bone from the temporoparietal and mastoid cortex. The suction irrigation in the left hand is attached to the bone pate collector. The chloromycetin laced solution is irrigated through the bone pate. In a second example, a four millimeter cutting burr is utilized to take pate of finer quality. Here you see the bone chips coming into the pate collector and being trapped within the screen. H 
We also recommend that bone pate be taken only from the sterile wound and not be removed from the surface of the skin or the drapes surrounding the patient. Once the screen is removed, the pate is then collected and placed within a sterile medicine cup. You will need approximately 15 cc's of pate to complete the procedure. This should be kept moist and covered until it's used later in the procedure. Perhaps the most important portion of the procedure is mastoid bowl preparation and skin removal. Returning to our previous view, you see the margin of the mastoid cavity with the skin being elevated from posteriorly. The surgeon attempts to keep the skin intact as much as possible throughout this portion of the procedure. Care is taken superiorly as in approximately a third of patients, the dural dehiscence is noted as well. In many patients, the skin surface turns posteriorly and on the back side of the margin of the concha, and the skin flap has to be created in order to allow reconstruction of the mastoid. Here you see a 15 blade in sizing just such a situation. Skin flaps are frequently trimmed as redundant skin is present. In this instance, a cutting burr is necessary to remove the margins of the mastoid bowl in order to clearly see the surface of the bowl. It is imperative that the surgeon remove all skin from the mastoid bowl before completing obliteration. Several steps which will be outlined will aid in reducing the chance that epithelium is left in place. In the example we are presenting to you, the mastoid bowl contains multiple spicules with invaginated bone. Most cases are not of this difficulty. Superiorly, dissection is accomplished with a wide-based instrument, again attempting to keep the skin intact, proceeding along the margin of the lining of the bowl with the tegma. Again, the drill is used to remove a small lip of bone in order to expose all of the contents of the mastoid bowl. As the section is carried further forward, the surgeon anticipates a potential facial nerve dehiscence, or as you see in this instance, exposure of the dura. The instrument here is touching the dura and is seen compressing it. Bone pate will be placed directly against the dura in order to reconstruct this dehiscence. Extreme care is taken in order to remove skin, preventing damage to the dura and resultant CSF leak. Again, if the surgeon cannot be entirely confident that all epithelium has been removed, then mastoid obliteration should not be attempted. Here you see the flap back in place and anteriorly highlighted the malleus, the tympanic membrane, and the mastoid bowl itself. In anticipation of reconstruction, flaps are left inferiorly, as you see here,
and superiorly to be placed over the obliterated space. Again, remnant tympanic membrane with enclosed malleus. The head of the malleus has been removed and the section is carried along the epitempanum at the horizontal facial nerve. You'll notice in this case that the middle ear space is pneumatized The remnant tympanic membrane is elevated along the handle of the malleus and the short process of the malleus is exposed. In this patient, a large facial nerve dehiscence in the horizontal segment is demonstrated. Later, fascia and bone pate will be utilized to reconstruct the surface covering the nerve at this position. Demonstrated are the malleus handle and the anterior sulcus of the tympanic membrane, as well as the tensor tympani, cochleariform process, dehiscent facial nerve in yellow, and the lateral semicircular canal in blue. Tissue is removed from the oval window, and in this case, the capitulum of the stapes is visible. An extremely important portion of the procedure is removal of a margin of bone with a diamond burr in order to ensure that all epithelium has been removed. Use of the diamond burr also removes all mucosal coverings and allows the bone pate to contact raw bone thereby facilitating healing. It's also imperative and important to keep the bone moist and viable using plenty of irrigation. Not all cases will require this amount of drilling, but due to the speculated nature of the mastoid bowl, judgment is used as to how much bone need be removed in order to ensure removal of all skin. Silastic of a thickness of 0 0.020 inches is trimmed and placed within the mesotympanum in anticipation of future transcanal vesicular reconstruction. The silastic is designed such that the entire mesotympanum and protympanum is filled. In the example given, a small slip of silastic is created to fit in the eustachian tube orifice. Prior to mastoid reconstruction, the silastic is positioned deep to the remnant tympanic membrane in anticipation of reconstruction. Once a surgeon has prepared the mastoid bowl, reconstruction is initiated by turning attention to the epitempanum. Here in diagrammatic fashion is the work that's been done with silastic within the middle ear space. Fascia of appropriate size is trimmed and placed directly on the floor of the epitempanum, including the dehiscent facial nerve and horizontal portion of the nerve itself. The bone pate is then placed in the epitempanum, reconstructing the bony tegment and dural exposure. The fascia is swung superiorly, trapping the bone pate in position, allowing it to heal and solidify. Here you see the previously harvested fascia cut into two pieces, the smaller of which is inserted with a small tail extending into the supertubal recess. You see the fascia being placed on the floor of the epitympanum, extending along the facial nerve, creating a space sequestered from the middle ear against the tegment. The fascia is left inferiorly, and bone pate is loaded on an elevator and handed to the surgeon to be positioned in the epitympanum. Once again, 
the bone pate is placed directly against the dural dehiscence and serves to reconstruct the area nicely. In a similar way, a fistula of any semicircular canal can be reconstructed. Fascia is placed between the fistula and the bone pate. Sufficient moisture is necessary within the bone chips in order to allow appropriate handling. The bone need not be compressed severely and removal of a portion of the water content is occasionally needed. The chips you see in this instance were taken with a six millimeter burr. Pate that is utilized should be of this size or smaller. The surgeon continues to sculpt the natural contour of the external auditory canal by placing the fascia along the floor of the epitemponum and completely covering the pate. The autogenous cranial bone is separated from the middle ear space. Any exposure of bone pate through the ear canal or to the mesotemponum will produce an infection and loss of pate. Here you see the fascia being swung superiorly to completely cover the transplanted bone. The fascia should be of appropriate length and sufficient length to allow it to extend to the remnant bony margin of the mastoid bowl superiorly. The retractor now is directly over the dehiscent facial nerve. In sequence, the mastoid bowl is then obliterated, reconstituting a relatively normal external auditory canal contour. Schematically, the epitemponym has finished, and the mastoid is filled with pate. A single piece of fascia is utilized to both reconstruct the tympanic membrane, abut the facial nerve, and cover the fascia posteriorly. In this hypotympanic view, the remnant tympanic membrane is present anteriorly in this situation without a malleus and facial ridge, facial nerve, the stapes foot plate are seen. After placement of the pate within the bowl, fascia is placed along the facial ridge and is used as a medial graft. Continuation of the obliteration. In similar fashion to fistulas of the lateral semicircular canal and a dehiscence of the tegmen, the sigmoid can be covered with pate as well. While a normal external auditory canal contour can be created, smooth appears to be much more important than small in terms of avoiding future infections and debris trapping. Typically, the pate will swell and enlarge a small amount in the immediate postoperative period. As the pate heals, a small amount of contracture occurs, leaving the pate in very close to the same position that the surgeon leaves it. The natural contour of the facial nerve allows an estimation of the bony external auditory canal contour that should be achieved. The epitympanic fascia is left in place and smoothed posteriorly, and then the remaining fascia is trimmed. Again, a single piece of fascia is important. Here you see an anterior portion 
at the arrow that is designed to provide the medial grafting for the tympanic membrane. The fascia is partially hydrated to make it easier to work with, and the bone pate is covered in entirety fascia is seen here being placed directly on the bony facial ridge. The posterior mesotympanum is filled with chloromycetin soaked gel foam in order to support the medial graft. The fascia is then advanced under the remnant tympanic membrane Once again, the surgeons should conceptualize a middle ear space completely separated from the bone pate by fascia. Here's a schematic showing the remnant tympanic membrane with the fascia being brought in to cover the pate and being placed as a medial graft under the remnant TM. The progression in the schematic re-emphasizes the point that fascia should contact the facial nerve ridge posteriorly and superiorly. The tympanic membrane is smoothed over the top of the fascia and then the previously created flaps are unfurled and placed directly over the fascia. The flaps are inspected and areas of underfolding prevented. In this situation, large flaps superiorly and inferiorly were retained. In other cases, very little to no skin is present in this stage of the procedure. Retention of the flaps, and in this case trimming so that they abut, reduces the healing phase of the procedure, and specifically with regards to epithelialization of the canal. Attention also should be paid laterally to the portions of the flap that will contact the skin remaining attached at the meatus. After placement of the flaps, antibiotic containing gel foam is placed in the external auditory canal in order to maintain the security of the reconstruction. Appropriate tension keeps flaps and pate from enlarging too severely. The external auditory canal is packed to the level of the lateral portion of the retained skin flaps. A final check is made of the reconstruction, being sure that all bony pate is covered to the free margin by fascia. The ear is then released from the retractor, hemostasis achieved, and attacking suture placed posteriorly. The surgeon then returns to the external auditory canal, unfurling the lateral flaps and filling the canal with antibiotic containing gel foam. Postericular wound is closed in the usual fashion with interrupted subcuticular sutures and steri strips are applied. 